Hey everyone, this is Mr. Shear. Today's lesson is about the rise of big business. We've talked about the recipe for industrialization. Now we're gonna talk about the power that big business has and some of the major players in big business. Just a reminder that if you haven't checked your grades and checked your grade sheets, please make sure you do so in Teams. Uh, see if you've missing anything or you're behind on anything. The zeros are starting to pile up for a few of you in there because you're falling behind. You fall behind like that, you're gonna find it's very difficult to catch up. So please double check those. Before, you're, uh, before the day's out and make sure that you go back and, and do the assignments that you might have missed along the way. Along the way behind is going to just end up being a, a difficult thing for you. So as we talk about industry, let's start out here with, okay, this right here. We're talking about big business and some of the people that run it and the rise of this during the industrial era. So what I want you to do to start with is obviously there are a lot of big leaders that are involved in this or business magnates that help industry rise to the top. I want you to watch the video that I've included in the Google Classroom called Traits of a Titan. It's pretty short, it's about three to five minutes. And in it, uh, it's gonna talk a little bit about some of these leaders of the industrial revolution. As you're watching, I want you to prepare to do this at the end. You're gonna list five or six characteristics that are mentioned that made these titans of business so successful. So as you're listening, listen for things that these people say in the video that make them successful. And then when you get to the end, I'll also ask you, do you think that each of these traits are important for leaders to have? And why or why not? So make sure as you're watching the video, you might wanna have a piece of scratch paper to list some of those characteristics that you hear so that when you, get to the, um, when you get to the question at the end, you're able to do that. So I'll pause here so you can watch the video and answer those questions. Okay, you probably heard a lot of different traits that are mentioned in there, uh, whether it's ambitious, whether it's highly motivated, innovative, there's so many different things. Um, a great question to think about in the follow-up there is if you think those traits are important for leaders to have. And we could have a discussion about that. I don't know what traits that you individually put, uh, but probably some of them are very, very important for our leaders to have and maybe uh, some that we would like to see more in our leaders today. So um, those are all kinds of things that you can consider as we look at the leaders of the industrial era and see whether they actually have some of those traits. When we talk about the rise of big business, we know that they've come to dominate the economy for a couple really important reasons during this time. Mostly agriculture economy transitions to big business for a couple reasons. Individuals, particularly uh, middle upper class or upper class individuals are ready to invest in businesses. They have extra income and they want to invest in businesses just like people buy stock nowadays. nowadays. Um, owning company stock of a successful business like a railroad or an oil company meant that that was going to turn out to be a very, very uh, good thing for you. So many individuals are ready to invest. Also, big corporations, as opposed to smaller businesses, big corporations could make larger quantity of goods at lower costs. And so they would uh, pr produce a better good at a cheaper price for most people and most consumers. And finally, they use two particular processes to, um, to make that accumulation of wealth and the efficiency of business uh, even more dominant. And those are called vertical and horizontal integration. And we're about to talk about those in a little bit of detail as they're really important concepts for you to understand. So I'm gonna teach you what vertical and horizontal integration means through a, a little demonstration or a little bit of an example. So you kind of, I like to, when we do this in class, we kind of draw this along and kind of do your own little drawing so you get the concept of horizontal and vertical. You can do that as you're following along in your notes and as I describe this, and go ahead and feel free to pause it in any place where you need to catch up. So for this example, we're gonna pretend that I, myself, Mr. Shear, has a business. It's gonna be a uh, bicycle business, okay? So we'll call it Shear Cycles. And in my factory, I produce the finest quality of bicycles that one can buy. It's a fairly successful business and I enjoy producing bicycles and it make modest uh, amount of profit and it's a good living. However, very soon across town opens another bicycle store. Bikes by Thornhill. Okay, as my major competition, Bikes by Thornhill is also producing bicycles and selling them and trying to produce them at a, at a better quality and at a cheaper price. So 
Myself and Mr. Thornhill end up in quite a competition for the bicycle business. People really like the way that um, Mr. Thornhill uh, constructs his bicycles. And so I see a lot of my business going to him. This is kind of upsetting. So as a result, I decide that I'm going to try something even a little bit more drastic. I decide to reduce the price of my bicycles so far down that I'm not even making a profit. I'm going to reduce the price of my bicycle so cheap that I'm actually losing money to produce bicycles. Well, what will happen over a short amount of time is that people will buy my bicycles and even though they're buying my bicycles, I'm selling them for less than it costs me to make them and so I'm not making any money, but nobody's buying from Mr. Thornhill anymore. And so I've won over a lot of the competition. I'm not making any money, but everybody's buying their bicycles from me. What I'm going to do is once I realize this, I'm going to go next door, Mr. Thornhill, and be like, hey, Mr. Thornhill, I feel really bad. And Mr. Thornhill says, yeah, it's been tough. You know, I just can't keep up with your prices. How do you do it? And I say, well, I've got my ways. But still, here, I've got to make you an offer. I feel really, really bad for you, Mr. Thornhill. You're not doing very well. Your, your, your business isn't working out very well. And so what I'm going to do is I'm, going to, I'm willing to offer to you, I'll buy your bicycle business. I'll give you a fair price on it. I'll buy out your business and you'll be successful. So Mr. Thornhill says, oh, that sounds like a pretty, pretty good deal because I'm not making any money. And so I buy Mr. Thornhill's bicycle business. He makes out pretty decently because I buy his business. And now my competition is gone and I can raise my prices back up. Well, shortly thereafter, along comes, <clears throat> and that's it, well, now we're, we're a merger, now we're one company. Shortly along comes another com competitor, Whiteman's Wheels. Mr. Whiteman has also started his own bicycle business and has branched out into the unicycle and tricycle business as well. And so many, many people are using Whiteman's Wheels for their bicycling and all their cycling needs. Well, that doesn't bode very well for my business. So I apply the same procedure again. I decided to lower my prices, lower than it even costs to make the bicycle. And all of a sudden, everybody that was buying from Whiteman's Wheel starts coming back to Shear Cycles so that I can get business again. Now, I'm not making any money because I'm selling them for cheaper than it costs. I'm actually losing money. But all the business is coming to Shear Cycles. So after a while, I feel really bit bad, and I call up Mr. Whiteman and say, Mr. Whiteman, find out that you're not doing too well. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Mr. Whiteman says, yeah, it's been really, really tough. Can't produce my tricycles, unicycles, and bicycles at a... Uh, at a fair price, you're just, your prices are too good. And I say, well, Mr. Whiteman, I feel really bad for you. I'm gonna cut you a deal. I'll buy your business from you so that way you don't have to lose any money anymore. You can make out of this not too bad. And Mr. Whiteman says, okay, well, I think I'd like to do that because I'm not gonna make any money otherwise. And so Mr. Shear buys Mr. Whiteman's wheels. And now I own all three shops. I own every shop in Sherman. I own Shear Cycles, Bikes by Thornhill, and Whiteman's wheels. And though I've lost a tremendous amount of money selling my bicycles, I am now in a great place. Because now that there's nobody else running any bicycle businesses in Sherman, I can execute my plan. I now begin to raise my prices. In fact, I don't just raise them up to where I'm making a little profit. Profit, I may rise them up to make a huge profit. In fact, I start selling my bicycles for ridiculous amounts of money. Because if people wanna buy some bicycles in Sherman, they're gonna buy it from Sheer Cycles. They have no other choice. I own all the businesses. And so this is what we know is horizontal integration, okay? Another word for horizontal integration that you're probably more familiar with is a monopoly. I own all the businesses that produce the bicycles and I have a complete monopoly over selling bicycles. And so I can charge whatever I want and people will be stuck paying whatever I want them to pay because I'm the only gig in town. Now, there's another thing, that, another tactic that one can use to get rich aside from horizontal integration, aside from monopolies, that also work very well, and it's called uh, vertical integration. See, when I make my bicycles, I have to buy all kinds of raw materials to manufacture them. I need to buy the metal. I need to buy the rubber for the tires. I need to buy um, some of the leather for the seats. I need all of these raw materials to be able to produce the bicycle, and I have to get them from somebody because I don't have them. That's called resources, okay, or raw materials. Those raw materials cost me money that I have to spend before I can spend them. So I have to buy them from someone else. That someone else, whoever produces those raw materials, wants to make a profit. So they charge me a little bit more money than it costs 
to, to, to um, extricate those raw materials. So it cost me a little bit of money. There's a markup there that I have to pay in order to get my raw material. Well, I realized that that's probably uh, more than I'd be willing to pay. I could do this even better if I was thinking straight. I could go out and I could buy me some, some land, some great land out there uh, outside of Sherman where I can produce or, and, and mine out some of my own raw materials. And then I don't have to pay anybody for them. So if I buy the mines and I buy the, the lumber yards, I buy all these places, then I don't have to pay the markup for somebody else's raw materials. So that's what I do. I go out there and I buy me up lots of land with mines on it and so that I can bring in my own raw materials and I don't have to pay somebody else for them and I can just use them at cost. Sounds like a great plan now that I don't have to pay anybody else for it. But the thing is, is that as my business grows and more and more people want share cycles and I want to sell more and more cycles, I have to be able to ship them all over the country. And when I ship them all over the country, that costs me a lot of money in shipping because bicycles are big and they come in really relatively big boxes, even when they're not assembled. So I'm spending a lot of money every month and, and, and day after day every month to sell my cycles all over the country because I have to pay somebody to ship them. Well, it comes to my mind that rather than transporting my goods all over the country and paying somebody to, to transport them by truck or by train or whatever it is, if I were able to buy my own trucking company or I would be able to buy my own rail line, then I wouldn't have to pay somebody else to ship my goods all over the place. So I do just that. I decide that I'm going to buy a railroad company so that I can ship my bicycles all over the country without having to pay somebody else. I have achieved now a different kind of integration that is very efficient and can make lots and lots of money. This is what we call vertical integration, where you own every part of the process from the time that those raw materials are, are, are taken out of the land to when they're manufactured in the factory to when they're transported to market to sell. I own every single one of those and every dollar within my company stays within my company. I don't have to pay anybody outside except for my employees. So I own the raw materials. I own uh, the factory and the manufacturing and I own the transportation. That's called vertical integration. Do you see the difference? When it comes to horizontal integration, you own completely a monopoly in one part of the process, usually manufacturing. Okay. So in this case, I own all of the bicycle manufacturing plants. Okay. When it comes to vertical integration, it's very, very similar in that I own every part of the process from top to bottom. So I own the raw materials, I own the factory that produces them, and I own the transportation. Two different methods that get a business owner or a corporation extremely wealthy. Because when you don't have to leave uh, any money outside your corporation, you can buy the raw materials and go through the whole process and never have to pay a dollar outside you can accumulate a great deal of money. It's hard to do, it's hard to have that much money or that much capital up front, but it can be done. On the other hand, when I own a monopoly or own every um, factory that produces the bicycle, I could charge a lot of money for those bicycles because there's no competition. And when there's no competition, I get to set the rules and I get to set the prices and can make a lot of money that way. Both horizontal integration or monopoly or vertical integration where I own every part of the process are methods that were used during the industrial age to be able to uh, grow these businesses and make them unimaginably wealthy. So uh, today, and by the way, here are some, uh, some other examples. Uh, these diagrams maybe, maybe are more clear for you than, than the ones I did. This is a, a monopoly or a horizontal integration where one, you, uh, one oil company here owns all of the refineries in an area, and so then they can call, charge whatever they like. And this over here gives you an example, another example of vertical integration, where uh, a, a farmer, for example, would own the delivery wagons and the meat packing plants and the cooled warehouses and the refrigerated railroad cars and the slaughterhouse and the cattle. They own every part of the process from the time that production starts of cattle to the time that gets into the meat, uh, store, the meat uh, market. So those are also examples of vertical or horizontal integration. Today, what it looks like, um, there aren't a whole, monopolies are illegal in our country, so you don't really see a whole lot of true monopolies occurring, but there are sometimes some examples of that. Uh, it's close to or, or a type of horizontal integration or monopoly 
with the Yum Brands uh, fast food chains. Uh, as you know, it's not just, or some of you are familiar with this, it's not just one restaurant, but this Yum Brands uh, Fran uh, Corporation owns KFC, they own Taco Bell, they own Pizza Hut, they own a &W, they own Long John Silver, so they own a ton of different uh, fast, food, fast food chains, and so they have a partial monopoly. Now, are there other fast food competitors? Yes, there are, but to some degree, they've got a lockdown on a large part of the fast food industry and can make a lot of um, decisions based on their big hold of the market share. So that's kind of a partial monopoly uh, and probably about as close to a good example as you can get today in our world. Vertical integration is also relatively rare and there are some big barriers to making this happen. Number one, it's just costs a ridiculous amount of money because it's hard to own the production, it's hard to own the retail, it's hard to own the, the shipping and the transportation. But two examples uh, are, are, that are like this uh, are Walmart, because as you know, if you watch the commercials and things like that, Walmart has some of its own producers, some of its own farms that, that um, sell the produce or the meat or different things like that. They obviously own the retail outlet, um, which is the store. And then they also own, and this is relatively rare for a lot of uh, companies in our, in our world today, they own their trucking company. And so they don't pay anybody to, to transport their goods either. So as such, they've kind of got some vertical integration going on there. Brahms is the same because Brahms owns uh, a lot of their farms and then they own their, uh, their retail distribution. And I believe, I'm not absolutely positive about this, but I'm pretty sure that they own their trucking company as well. And they transport their goods. So they have somewhat of a vertical integration as well. These two um, business tactics can lead to a, a corporation becoming wealthy beyond imagination because it is so efficient with vertical integration and because uh, under a monopoly or horizontal integration uh, it's unfair competition. So what you'll see is a lot of companies try to achieve this and they try to do this by consolidating businesses. Many business leaders use what they call trusts or holding companies to get around laws that were made against monopolies. One of those laws is called the Sherman Antitrust Act and the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed to try to prevent companies from doing these monopolies because when there are monopolies we the consumers get screwed over because there's no uh, there's no competition well business leaders find ways to to get around that they form trusts or these other corporation or holding companies that don't really do anything but they buy up stock in a lot of different companies and then they run it as if it were one company so they find loopholes to get around this and to destroy competition at the same time Perfect examples of this during the time were oil and steel, some of the biggest businesses in the world during the industrial era because of how much they were used in uh, continuing to build business and industry and, and all the mechanization of, uh, of the workforce. So they were huge examples of that. And so laws like the Sherman Antitrust Act, not named after Sherman, Texas, by the way, but the Sherman Antitrust Act tried to eliminate such practices, but there were so many loopholes and so many ways around it that uh, it didn't really do much to slow down the, the abuse of these big, powerful businesses. So let's talk about a couple of these big, these big time titans of industry and what they did to, to get their fortunes. So I get our little titans reference over here. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Anyway, so one of the biggest of the times is Andrew Carnegie. And you might have heard the name before because it's around all over the place. But Andrew Carnegie was a Scottish immigrant. And he kind of had this rags to riches story. He came as a Scottish uh, young, a young boy with his family. He worked in the railroad yard. He was basically like a messenger boy. And one day he had this, um, th there was this big tie up in the railroad yard. And so he was responsible for running messages all across the rail yard and did just a really good job helping solve this, um, this, this big problem that they had that day. And so the, the company owner goes to, to Andrew and says, we will give you the opportunity, we'll let you buy stock in, in our company, in the railroad company, so that you can have a part of the company. And Andrew's family was not very wealthy, and so they sold a lot of what they had so that they would have the opportunity to buy stock in the railroad company. Well, as you already know, the railroad industry is booming at this time and expanding way into the West. So his little bit of investment in the railroad company begins to grow exponentially as the railroad grows. And he works his way through and, and up in, his, in the railroad company and it owns more and more stock and becomes more wealthy. And so much so that by the time he's younger than Mr. Shear, his, he's ready to retire and call it good because he's so rich. 
it's about then that he kind of tours around and he's on vacation and decides and he's over in England and he meets up with somebody who has found an interesting, fast and efficient way to produce steel. Steel was not mass produced very much because it was so expensive and hard to do. But there was a man by the name of Henry Bessemer who created what they call the Bessemer process for in one big gigantic cauldron called a Bessemer converter had figured out a way to produce iron, uh, to produce steel from iron quickly and efficiently. So Andrew Carnegie comes back to the United States. He's retired from the railroad industry pretty much and he's got this idea now. He's like, oh, I'm gonna get back in and I'm gonna decide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this gigantic steel company. And so he buys Bessemer converters, brings them to the United States, buys a bunch of land, sets up the steel company, basically almost spends every penny that he had. And remember, he was already pretty wealthy. He spends almost every penny he has to try to produce this steel company and brings the Bessemer converters over and it works. And he creates one of the largest companies in, 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 at that time in the country called U.S. Steel. And everybody's using steel. The railroad companies are using steel. They're using steel in architecture. They're using steel in, uh, in uh, maritime construction, so uh, in boats. Steel's everywhere. And so he makes a fortune off this because he can produce steel and is one of the only people in the world that can do it that cheaply and that efficiently. And so he becomes even more ridiculously wealthy, one of the most wealthy people ever in the history of the country. And as such, um, he does run into his problems, but we'll talk about that in a little bit, but he becomes so wealthy and he believes in something um, very passionately that uh, anybody can be like him, that they could have a rags to riches story themselves, that they could grow up and that they can be successful, they can come from nothing. And so he becomes a, a huge, what we call a philanthropist. That means he gives away lots of his money to charities and specifically a lot to uh, into education because he wanted young people, uh, kids that were um, from poor families to be able to get an education and to do like he did and work, work their way up through the chain and become hopefully successful and wealthy like he did. He gives millions and millions of dollars away and a lot of it is framed in education so much money and so um this his idea of giving away money he he called his gospel of wealth and it is this idea that people like him with an mass amount of wealth can do a, a great deal of good to society as they give it away and that people like him should be able to amass a lot of wealth because they know what to do with it and they can distribute out in, the, in society quite a bit. So there's some good and bad there. An example of this might be here. This should look at least a little bit familiar to you. Many of you have probably seen this before. You've driven by it. It's actually right here in Sherman. Do you know what it is? Some of you might. It's uh, Today it's known as the Red River Museum. The Red River Museum is, uh, hasn't always been a museum, however. It is one of the first what they call Carnegie libraries. Andrew Carnegie donated millions of dollars to create libraries all over the country. He did it so much and so many times that these Car Carnegie li libraries were everybody everywhere and popped up in towns all throughout the country. In so much that there was one even here in Sherman, Texas, a library built and financed entirely by Andrew Carnegie. That's how far the extent of his wealth reached. So not a library anymore, obviously it's moved, but that building is still there. And that was in one of the original Carnegie libraries, uh, money donated by Andrew Carnegie. Another huge titan of industry was John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller made his riches in the Standard Oil Company. And Standard Oil, of course, petroleum is becoming a huge business once they find resources. We talked about Edwin Drake before and his first oil well. But now, okay, petroleum's coming of age, whether it's um, for uh, energy and for heating houses and things like that, but also, of course, we're right around the corner here to automobiles. So because of that, um, it's a great business to be in. And Rockefeller uses monopolies and trusts, uses that horizontal integration to consolidate businesses and dominate the oil market. And, some, and he's a perfect example of somebody that used the predatory pricing like I used in my example, where he would lower those prices way down to, 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 to taking a loss and drive other people out of business and buy up their business. So, I mean, he uses some pretty serious tactics to be able to control the oil industry. And once he does, he can charge just about whatever he wants and makes millions upon millions uh, in the industry. 
he is generally regarded as the richest American of all time and one of the richest modern human beings of all time, with his net worth reaching somewhere in the in the neighborhood of about two hundred and fifty three billion dollars. So most people figure that he was was and still is today uh, if were he alive uh, or compared to people that are alive today, your Jeff Bezos is your uh, all, Bill Gates is he's worth more than he would have been worth more than all of them as well. So that two hundred fifty three billion he is considered the, the the wealthiest American of all time still even. Um, but he also was a philanthropist, and he gave away lots of his money to different charities, um, hundreds of millions to uh, everything from medical research to, um, uh, to churches and religion, different things like that. So, I mean, he had so many charities um, that he gave uh, a tremendous amount of money to, and his estate, his, uh, you know, his uh, money that he's passed down through generations, they continue to give away uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars um, yearly, so... The question is, though, there's this, kind of this controversy for these people. Uh, on one hand, they're great philanthropists and they give lots of money away, but also these big business leaders are oftentimes referred to as the robber barons because there's a little bit of a duality to, to who they are. In one case, these philanthropists, they're philanthropists because they give money away and try to hopefully help people. In the other sense, they're taking it. Uh, they call them robber barons for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, to become the six successful, these guys in their factories, in their uh, workplaces, they're paying their workers very, very little. They're working them long hours in very difficult conditions. That's how you get a business that, that, that is that ridiculously wealthy in the time, is they take advantage of their workers, they pay them very little. And because of that, they exploit the heck out of them. And sometimes even Carnegie was famous for that his, his workers strike and he just brings in other people that are willing to take the job. And so in many ways, these guys used some, some very questionable practices when it comes to their workers. On top of that, they clearly used some pretty corrupt business practices. We talked about John D. Rockefeller and that horizontal integration. And basically, uh, that's, that monopoly is kind of a corrupt business practice. It's, um, it eliminates competition, and, and it ends up being eventually worse for us as consumers. So they, they, they took bribes. They did all kinds of things like that to get to the top. And so as far as businessmen, they were pretty corrupt in that way as well. And just furthermore, they, would, they did whatever they can. They were completely motivated by that wealth and the accumulation of wealth. And some people would call that greedy, um, may or may not be, but they were dedicated to that absolute accumulation of money. And so as such, many people called them rot robber barons and said, these guys are pretty morally corrupt. On the other hand, um, there are a lot of people that would recognize and say, well, yeah, but they gave away so much money and they gave away all this money to help people in charity and everything else like that. But they produce jobs. So um, there's a little bit of both, right? They're extremely corrupt in many ways and they're taking advantage of individuals, but at the same time, they're giving back in the community. So it's kind of a complicated situation as to how do we view them in history and how do we look at them? Are they robbers or are they, are they truly charitable individuals? I've noted here that in the railroad company, uh, industry that was particularly corrupt. There were individuals, um, uh, Jay Gould is one example, Cornelius Vanderbilt is another example, um, that would use all kinds of tactics to take advantage of farmers, take advantage of each other, uh, lie steep, shield, do whatever they can to get ahead in the railroad industry. So the railroad industry itself was particularly noted for being that. And I actually have a video that, that talks a little bit about Vanderbilt and, and some of the kind of things that they did back and forth to to try to take advantage of one, one against another. I've included that in the Google Classroom. You can take an opportunity to watch that now. Okay, so that takes us to the end. Um, this is big business. There's um, certainly some really important concepts from this. Understanding that horizontal and vertical integration is really important. And really knowing uh, a little bit about Carnegie and Rockefeller is also extremely important. And then there's finally the concept of understanding what should we make of these people, these great big business leaders? Are they uh, somebody to be revered? Are they somebody to be, uh, to be judged a little bit more harshly because of the treatment of, uh, of their workers and because of some of the business practices they use? One of those, that's a, that's a pretty complicated question and something worth considering as well. What I need you to do is since we've come to the end, I need you to make sure that you've completed all the past assignments. We're coming towards, or we've come towards the end of the nine weeks here, or I'm not sure, the first three weeks of the first nine weeks. So just a progress report term. 
So please make sure that you go back and you take a look here and double check to make sure that you've done all the assignments. There are a lot of zeros in the book, a lot of things that people, because you've moved in or out of classes, might have missed. Check your grade in, in Teams, see if there are things you missed, and then go back and complete those things which you missed. Our closure activity today is another visual vocab for this chapter. There are 10 words in there. You do the same thing as we did last chapter. Find the definition, uh, put it in your own words. That's the bell, so that must mean it's time to be, time to be done. Put it in your own words and then find a, a, an image online that you think represents that. Copy and paste it and then go ahead and put that in for each word or each term in the slideshow. All right, so hopefully that clarifies. If you have any questions, as always, please let me know. Happy to be able to answer those for you. Good luck. Hope you enjoyed the lesson. We'll see you next time.